morning, everybody. Hi. Nice to see you all and know you're all with us. <laughs> oh. Hi, my name is Cynthia Cook, and I'm the um, president of the Historical Society of the Town of Clinton. And we have an exciting program for you this evening. It's one of our series of first Friday programs. But before sure. we do the program, I just want to make a few announcements about some upcoming activities. Um, first of all, if well, you, you may you know, know that we have received a grant to have a new historical marker installed in Clinton, and it's a, going to mark the site of the historic Fiddler's Bridge, which is a, a myth or a legend of, of Clinton. And there will be a little um, celebration of the new sign, which is going to take place at 2 p.m. on May, May 22nd. Whoever's speaking, if you can mute yourself, that would be helpful. So it, if you had our newsletter, note that we had a different date. The correct date is now May 22nd, and it's going to be held at Crim Primrose Hill Farm at 2 p.m. Uh, on a Sunday afternoon. So um, mark your calendars anew for that. And I also, another change from what we had in the newsletter is the driving tour. We had it's a program we started in 1919. We could not hold it for the past two years, but it is a tour um, where people drive themselves around the town of Clinton, looking at selected historic houses. And we provide docents and little historical narratives. In fact, the tour is already mapped out on this big map behind me. So if you are the owner of a Clinton landmark house, you might see your house on those blue stickies back there. <laughs> but that, instead of taking place this June, is going to take place September 24th. We've, we've, we've had, to put that, had to put that off. So those are the two changes. I also want to talk about our next our next, Our next Friday, Friday program. They're having trouble. Is that my phone? You hold on. Huh? That's probably my phone. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, try to ignore that phone and uh, I will carry on. We are, our next first Friday program will be on Friday, June 3rd. Yeah, go ahead. And it um, is going to be on farming in Clinton, Clinton History Projects. Crystal Middleton, who is a program um, administrator over at the Clinton Public Library, will be speaking, as will Bob Schock, who will be speaking about his farm, Primrose Hill Farm, which makes, and that's going to be Friday, June 3rd at 7.30, a, May, a, May, a really good segue into the next program, which is our summer history exhibit, organized, um, the theme will be farming in Clinton between, um, well, between 1890 and 1920. So I think those are my, um, my announcements and corrections. So I hope, you, um, I hope you can join us for any and all of those in the, in the coming months. That's our spring, um, spring agenda. We also um, have two incredibly important people beyond our speaker um, who made this, this evening possible. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Kathy McMahon, who handles all of our IT issues. And she, we're down here at the Creek Meeting House uh, so that we could make sure that our speaker's um, PowerPoint would work. And Kathy came down here uh, with her husband, Frank. So we're all gathering um, back here in the Clinton Corners to do the program. But I want to thank Kathy. And then most of all, Barbara Sweet, who is our um, chairman of programs. And is she who has the honor of introducing you to this evening's guest speaker, Fred Schaefer. And with that, I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here, but not on screen. <laughs> okay, Cynthia, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully people can hear me. Okay, um, if uh, you can't, uh, then turn your volume up, I guess. I, I wanted to introduce Fred Schaefer to you. Uh, Fred is a resident of a little town uh, near us, Pleasant Valley, here in Dutchess County. He's been 
of practicing attorney in the uh, Poughkeepsie area for over 50 years. Uh, he's a bicycle enthusiast who has promoted cycling in the area by organizing group rides, uh, by encouraging Dutchess County to publish bike maps, advertise the county as being biz bicycle friendly. He's also been a leading advocate of construction of the Dutchess Rail Trail, which uh, he may tell you more about, uh, which is the county, which the county built while he led the walkway effort. Um, he continues to participate in efforts to promote and improve the walkway. So um, I will just tell you when I say walkway, I mean the old Poughkeepsie Highland Railroad Bridge. So welcome to you, Fred, and we'd like to hear what you have to say. Oh, great. Thanks, Barbara, very much for the nice introduction. And I recognize a lot of faces out there, so uh, you know, I hope I can uh, give you some more information about the uh, bridge that you might know already. Oh, yeah. I just got to get the uh, camera work working here. There it is. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and you can see the slide, right? This is a picture of, of the uh, railroad bridge over the Hudson River. Yes. Uh, which um, I took from a hot air balloon. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit of history about the bridge because I think that was fascinating to begin with. And one of the reasons. I'm just trying to get this thing to. One of the reasons that I got involved was because uh, I love history too, besides uh, everything else. Uh, the idea for the railroad bridge over the Hudson came from some businessmen in Poughkeepsie in 1868. They thought it would be good for business in the area. They formed the Poughkeepsie Railroad Bridge Company in 1871. It took 17 years for it to be constructed. It's almost about as long as it took for us to get the, the walkway done. Uh, I took this photo from a hot air balloon it shows that half of the bridge is over Poughkeepsie. Um, so here's a picture I took of the bridge uh, from the hillside on the highland side. And the construction of the bridge required four large piers in the Hudson River. They look small, but what you see is just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, over the river, the bridge rests on four wooden caissons, each one 60 feet wide and 1,000 of 100 feet long. They go down 120 feet through 50 feet of water and 70 feet of sand and muck. They use steam shovels to dig into the sand and remove it. The caissons are split into sections and filled with rocks and concrete. We have the original plans for the bridge, which we can thank to Dick Holler, who was a member of the society here, uh, who went down to Philadelphia and got them. Dick was very instrumental in helping with the walkway project uh, for many years. I hope he uh, didn't get online tonight because he was going to try to his home. Uh, okay, yeah, hopefully he'll get on soon. When inspected, the caissons have not even moved an inch. We had to inspect them and uh, they uh, sit in the water, uh, which is very good because that means the bridge will stay stable. This is a picture of the scaffolding when they built the bridge. And just imagine in 1888 trying to do this. It's just mind boggling that they uh, got this bridge done. That's only one section of the bridge. Um, and it's, um, they didn't have the machines that we have nowadays. This is where the upper level is about to be connected to uh, each side. Some people claimed it was the eighth wonder of the world at the time when they built the bridge. 
at the time, it was the longest bridge in North America. It is. It was the only bridge across the Hudson River south of Albany, so it connected New England to the rest of the country. Here's a photo of the engine pulling freight cars across the bridge after it opened. By the 1900s, up to 50 freight trains a day with a total of 3,500 freight cars crossed it. The trains carried coal and grain to New England and manufactured goods to tie the West, to tie the uh, Western states together, goods to be sent to the Western states. Uh, this is a picture uh, of a guard guarding the bridge. During the wars uh, uh, that we had with other foreign countries, uh, they were afraid that the bridge would be blown up by the enemies, so they uh, had guards protecting it. And the uh, lady, in, yeah, which, lady in Highland uh, gave me this picture. I think it was her father or grandfather. Oh, wow. Now, Dick Hotler, I hope he's on by this time because... Uh, uh, he is the one that scraped the rust off the bridge to show that Andrew Carnegie made the steel on the bridge, a lot of it. Uh, they actually used so much steel that they ran out of steel and had to get it from uh, of even foreign countries. Um, but the, the, the bridge was very well built, as we found out when we, when we had it inspected. This photo uh, is when the bridge burned in uh, 1974. In the 1950s, the interstate highway system made use of trucks to ship goods in the country more economical than the use of freight trains. So train traffic dwindled down. The New Haven Railroad, who owned the bridge in the 1970s, went into bankruptcy. By 1974, only one train a day crossed the railroad bridge. On May 8, 1974, a fire broke out due to sparks from the brakes as a train went down the grade into Poughkeepsie. The fire burned about 1,000 feet of the tracks over Poughkeepsie, closing it to train traffic, ending 85 years of continuous use. Plans to repair and reopen it never materialized and the bridge was totally abandoned and sold to investors first and later to a railroad buff. Railroad. Access continued to be available from the Highland side by a path off Highland Road. Not many people knew about it because it was in the woods. On the Poughkeepsie side, all tracks were removed and it was fenced off at the Washington Street entrance so that no one could go up on it. In December of 1992, I met a fellow by the name of Bill Seppi through a mutual friend. For a year or so, Seppi, a Poughkeepsie resident, had been promoting the idea of renovating, renovating the railroad bridge over the Hudson River into a walkway for local people to have access to it in order to enjoy the peaceful views. And he really meant local people. He did not uh, want many people to be using the bridge because he liked to have it nice and quiet up on the bridge. I told him I was interested in his project and volunteered to help him. A few weeks later, he took me out on the bridge which was accessible from the Highland side. This is what the bridge looked like in January of 1993 when I first went up on it with Bill Seppi. And as you can see, it had some uh, weakness in, in it and that they were the wooden, wooden uh, uh, sides were rotting away. And in some places, the railings were dropping off and that. So um, it didn't, uh, wasn't very appealing at that time. And it was very scary to walk out on it. Oh, oh after that. Mm. This view is of the Hudson River looking north from the bridge 
from the bridge. And uh, as you can see, it's just beautiful, uh, even in, in the winter time. This is a view looking south from the bridge. When I saw these views of the Hudson River, it took my breath away. Uh, just like when I bicycled through West Point often and stopped to look at the view of the Hudson River. In those days, I'm talking about when I went up on the bridge back in 1993 and four, um, bicycling was my main hobby. Every year I organized a 40 mile ride from Beacon to West Point and back. When we reached West Point, the view was breathtaking. I always took a group photo of this view. Now I wanted everyone to be able to see these views from the railroad bridge too. Not just local people as Seppi wanted. I wanted it to be a bike path connected to bike trails on both sides for everyone to enjoy. After going on the bridge, I knew it would be costly to turn it into a bike path. The first one I thought of to help was a casual friend of mine, Rob Dyson. We knew each other because our sons were good friends at Arlington High School. Rob and I coached their little league baseball team and rode our bikes together now and then. I knew Rob was a fun person who liked to do interesting things. Also, he had a foundation that used its money to do a lot of good for the community, especially Marist College and Vassa Hospital. On January 6, 1993, two weeks after my first tour of the bridge with um, Seppi, I invited Dyson to tour the bridge with me and Seppi. On that day of our visit, it was six degrees outside. In this photo, you can see how easy it was to get on the bridge from the west end of, the high, of Highland. It was a miracle that no one fell off during the 15 years or so that the bridge was abandoned. There were large stones keeping cars out, but people could walk right between them. In Poughkeepsie, it was well fenced off to keep every, everyone off it, but not so on the Highland side which was good for us because that gave us the ability to go out and see what beautiful scenery we had. This is that same day. And in this photo, you can see Rob Dyson with the hat on um, in front, taking his first look at the view. He fell in love with the idea of a bike path and walkway too. We walked out over the Hudson River to enjoy the views, even though winter had come and the temperature was six degrees. We still joke about how he was crazy to leave his warm house to go out, to go out over, over the river in the freezing weather. After this tour, Dyson talked to Seppi a few times, but was not happy with Seppi's vision of using volunteers to work on the bridge instead of professionals nor did he think it could be done without public financing, which is what Seppi wanted. Uh, Seppi did not want was public financing. So Dyson knew that this was gonna be expensive and uh, that you would need some public fi financing. Thus, Dyson was not interested in getting involved with Seppi's project. But for the next 10 years, when our paths crossed, he would say to me, one day we have to get the walkway done. This gave me hope uh, for the next 10 years after this visit to the bridge. Meanwhile, while Seppi was uh, starting to do things that he wanted to do with the bridge, I decided to stay involved with him and offered to help him with the project, hoping for a miracle to come along that it would become what I wanted too, with bikes on the bridge. Seppi uh, did not want any bikes on the bridge. He wanted just people to walk in, in a quiet atmosphere. It did take 15 years for the miracle to arrive uh, that we did get, get the bridge done or started anyway. 
But in the meantime, I did some things I thought might help while Seppi did it his way. Seppi started recruiting volunteers to work on a bridge to fix up areas that needed repairs and put down wooden planks on the existing ties. He wanted all work to be done by volunteers. He did not want any public funds to be used because he believed public funds should be used only for health and education, not for a park. He began to invite people to tour the bridge now and then. At the same time, Seppi went his way. I did things my way that I thought might help get it done. Some of my efforts included promoting bicycle tourism and trying to get Dutchess County to turn the old railroad bed from Hopo Junction to Poughkeepsie into a rail trail that would be that would tie into the abandoned bridge over the Hudson. On May 3rd of 1994, the Poughkeepsie Journal published a Vantage Point article I wrote. Article, it's him. Uh, I wrote in response to the journal's request for what should be done to help our community economy after IBM downsized in 1993. IBM downsized from 20,000 workers to 12,000 workers in the area and our economy took a bad turn. The county was seeking manufacturing firms to fill the gap. I wrote this Vantage Point article for the Poughkeepsie Journal as an alternative. I mentioned that the county should pursue bicycle tourism to jumpstart the economy. In it, I suggested that the county do bicycle maps of the area, add shoulders to the roads to make them safer, and actively entice people to visit the area to bike. Lastly, I suggested the county develop the abandoned railroad line from Poughkeepsie to Helpwell Junction into a rail trail and that the abandoned railroad bridge be turned into a walkway and bike path. As a result of this article, Karen Woods, the head of the Dutchess County Tourism Agency, called me a few days later and asked me to serve on the Dutchess County Tourism Agency board, which I did. I also met with the Dutchess County Planning Board to encourage improvements of roads for bicycles and to make bicycle maps for the area. I also did a lot of tours of the bridge uh, after I had been up on the bridge in order to build up support for the walkway project. I thought if people saw the view, they might realize its potential. This group in the photo are staff people from the Dutchess County Planning Department. Roger Akeley was head of the department and became a strong supporter of the walkway project and the Dutchess Rail Trail. He thought of the bridge as New York's Eiffel Tower. On March 23rd, 1995, I spoke before the Dutchess County Environmental Planning Council to advocate for a road bed to be turned into the rail trail uh, for the road bed that hide the uh, one from Poughkeepsie to Hopo Junction. A Poughkeepsie Journal reporter was there and he wrote this article, uh, which you can see on the screen. Uh, I don't know if you can read it. It's not necessary for you, for you to read it, but just so you know that the Poughkeepsie Journal supported uh, the argument to plan, the argument to build a, a road along the Maybrook right of way faded over the years as most people realized it would be too expensive. Well, so I, should, I mean, the plan to, to build a road would be too expensive. Uh, and also most local residents opposed turning into a highway. Uh, and with IBM downsizing from 20,000 people to 12,000 workers it was not necessary. So the Poughkeepsie Journal agreed that it would be good to turn the railroad bed into a rail trail. And the Poughkeepsie Journal, the next thing is a uh, editorial that the Poughkeepsie Journal 
on March 29, 1995, a few days after the prior article appeared, the Poughkeepsie Journal published this editorial, which supported my proposal to turn the Maybrook line purchased by Dutchess County into a rail trail. In the spring of 1995, Dutchess County Planning Board, Planning Board member, Kelly Solomon and I went to Massachusetts and New Paul's to ride existing bike trails since there were none in our area. She was a staff person preparing the county's bicycle plan. I wanted to convince her to add rail trails into the bicycle plan. I took photos of the trails, which I later used in my presentation to the county legislature. Boy, he was using new poles as their bike trail? Wow. Yeah, I couldn't quite believe that. About the same time, uh, on April 3rd of 1995, Jim Sproat, who was a county legislator, introduced this resolution, and again, you don't have to read it, I'm, I'm gonna sort of summarize it, uh, in which he requested the county executive to develop a plan to sell County Route 11 roadbed, uh, which was the opposite of what I wanted, but uh, the rest of the um, resolution said that alternatives might be considered. Luckily, I saw an article in the paper uh, about this in the, in the Poughkeepsie Journal, and I spoke to my county legislator, Suzanne Horn. I think she's listening tonight, hopefully. She talked to Jim Sprout, and he invited me to attend the public work committee meeting on the resolution. I attended the committee meeting and presented my alternative to selling the roadbed, which was to create a rail trail out of it. I showed these photos of existing trails and explained why it would be a good idea to convert the Maybrook oh, right. line, uh, line roadbed into a trail. Yeah. You can see the Mohonk. Yeah. To my surprise, it was well received. This is what was well received was at the meeting that I, I didn't expect it to be so quickly received. On April 25th, 1995, I took County Legislator Jim Sprout. He's the one uh, second from the left. Uh, I took him on a tour of the railroad bridge and told him about the possibility of connecting the Maybrook line rail trail, which is the one I spoke to about a minute ago with the railroad bridge eventually. Jim Sproat, after that, supported the proposed rail trail plus also the walkway. Coincidentally, about 10 years later, he became chairman of the New York State Bridge Authority and as such supported the walkway project. Um, at that time, I was also writing columns for the uh, local newspaper in Pleasant Valley and uh, I published this article about Rails to Trails Revisited. At the time, I was writing a weekly column for the Taconic News. So I wrote an article urging the Dutchess County Legislature to create a bike trail on the railroad bed instead of selling it. On May 8th of 1995, I attended a meeting of the Dutchess County Legislature and made my presentation to the 35 members to let me create the Duchess Rail Trail. They voted yes on a revised resolution that the Maybrook right of way may be considered for use as an interim basis as a recreational trail. This is instead of selling it. The resolution passed the county legislature by 34 to one. My plan was for each of the four towns that the trail went through would build the portion of the rail trail that went through their town. Two of the town supervisors had already agreed with me to do it. On June 1st, 1995, I met with County Executive Bill um, Steinhaus, Bill Steinhaus at his office and told him about my reasons for the right of way to become a rail trail. 
Up to this point, he had been silent with regard to the issue. He told me that the county had no money to do the trail. I showed him pictures of people riding on the Walco Valley Trail and told him of my plan for each of the four towns to do their portion. He agreed that creating a rail trail for the Maybrook right of way may be a good idea. He agreed to support my efforts with each town and to allow the Dutchess County Planning Board to help with it. After I had a couple of meetings with the Dutchess County Planning Board with regard to proceeding on the trail, one month later, on July 3rd, 1995, this is three months after I talked to Seppi, um, the Steinhouse directly, I was invited by County Executive Steinhouse to attend a press conference on the Maybrook right of way at its intersection with Overrocker Road. At the press conference, Steinhouse announced that Dutchess County would seek funding for and construct the Dutchess Rail Trail from Hopewell Junction to Poughkeepsie. I think he took it over from me because everyone thought it was a good idea. That was a nice surprise and took a lot of pressure off me, which allowed me to stay focused on the walkway bridge project instead of doing the rail trail. Oh yeah, after it was done, Steinhaus named the trail after him, but that's fine. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so this this is a, an article from the uh, editorial from the county um, Poughkeepsie Journal, and uh, in it I've highlighted uh, they they agreed uh, that it was my persistence of uh, the plans for the Maybrook Bridge now that the Dutchess County were going to do it, and so I just thought I'd throw that one in. Okay, that was an editorial by the Poughkeepsie Journal. Let me just catch up here where I am. For the next few years, I promoted the walkway project. I was not a person to work on the bridge itself, like Dick Kyler, who is um, hopefully listening by this time, did. So I just talked it up on my travels and brought some groups of people on the bridge to share the view and the idea of a bike and walking path. This photo is one uh, of Mark Adams of Adams Ferrica Farms of route, on Route 44. On May 10th of 1994, I took Ham and Helen Reserve and their son for a tour of the bridge. They were owners and editors of the Taconic Press newspaper serving rural Dutchess County. My idea here was to, to try to get as many people behind it and people with some good say in the community to support the project. To sum up my activities, I took uh, for a tour of the bridge, almost anybody who was crazy enough to go up on the bridge with me, including this group of local people, most of them from Pleasant Valley, I guess from Pleasant Valley and Poughkeepsie. And you can see uh, we even did uh, trips up to the bridge, even in the winter, snow on the ground. Started out with about uh, five or 10 people and got up to longer, longer groups of people as time went on. And I took a, I always took their names so that I could uh, get some support from them later on. This group is a fellow by the name of Ross Robbins is on the left and he was the bicycle person for the New York State Department of Transportation. And I took him up and made a, a plea to him for the walkway and uh, to get his support, support for the Dutchess Rail Trail too. Okay. And in the year 2000, uh, my son graduated from Rochester in Institute of Technology. After my attendance at the graduation, we did some biking around the area and came upon this bridge, the Pondere Bridge, which was a car bridge over the Genesee River, 
that was converted into a walkway and bike path. For many years, I carried it around with me. And when I showed it to people after talking about the walkway project, it opened up their eyes of some people who could not visualize it until they saw this picture. Sometime during this period, I found this postcard on eBay. It is the Henry Hudson Bridge over the Harlem River in New York City. It was built in 1909 to honor Henry Hudson on the, 30th, on the 300th anniversary of his sailing up the Hudson River. It gave me the idea to do the walkway project in honor of the 400th anniversary, which was a few years away. So I started mentioning, mentioning it, uh, the uh, Henry Hudson's anniversary, as part of my reasons for doing the project. We did wind up eventually, many years later, of getting New York State to contribute $20 million to the project for this very reason. This is about 10 years be before uh, we actually got into the, pr the uh, process of building the bridge. During that period of time from when I first went up on the bridge until the year 2000, uh, about a seven year period, SEPI continued making renovations to the bridge, which I did not take a part in. I did become a board member of the Walkway Not-for-Profit Corporation that he formed around 1995. I did help him get insurance for the corporation. In 1998, he also managed for the Walkway Corporation, Mississippi, to buy the bridge for $1 from the railroad buff in Pennsylvania who owned it. And this was one of the greatest things that Bill Seppi did uh, on the project because he put the title to the, title to the railroad bridge in the name of the corporation. Uh, and this was a big turning point in the efforts to turn the bridge into a walkway. These two pictures, uh, this picture here, shows some of the work that Seppi was doing. And on the left is uh, Bill Keating, who became a board member later on. Um, Seppi is in the middle, you can barely see him in the background, uh, but they are doing a lot of work on the bridge just to make it safe for people to walk on. And there's another picture of what they were doing. Uh, let me catch up with we Okay, for, se for seven years, Seppi continued making renovations to the bridge. Um, I, I, okay, I'm losing place where I am here. In 19, yeah, okay. Seppi also invited people to tour the bridge. And this is a picture of, on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. He let people walk out on, on the bridge. And uh, a lot of people did come out and he managed to raise some funds uh, by selling walkway merchandise. And quite a few people paid $35 for the name to appear on the planks. He was going to make the walkway out. And again, to remind you, he just wanted to put planks on top of the, the bridge uh, almost the way it was. And then uh, I think the railings were gonna stay about the same too. Um, and, but I never did get into details with him because I didn't, I didn't think his way of going was really too practical, but I, I hung in there just to see what would happen. So about the year 2000, Seppi was doing work on the bridge where it was over land in the town of Lloyd. This is Bill Seppi in the picture. A volunteer was seriously injured the town of Lloyd got a court order prohibiting Seppi from doing work on the bridge and from giving tours. Seppi continued to build up the membership and raise funds and hired a local attorney, Noel Tepper, to fight the court order to no avail. So for some time until June, from that time until June of, 19, of 2003, no progress was being made to get the project moving along. 
and that's a three-year period when virtually nothing took place between the year 2000 and 2003. In June of 2003, a fellow by the name of Mitch Mackey, oh, Mitch, Mitch McKay, contacted me to discuss the situation. I told him where it stood, and we started meeting in my office in Poughkeepsie to discuss the situation with a small group of people who were interested in the project. Some of them uh, were Dick Kala, who, again, I mentioned, hopefully he's hearing this presentation tonight. Uh, Judy Moran, who became a board member, and she was very active with CEPI. And Bill Keating and Dave Santner are four of them. I think there were three or four others, uh, but I don't have their names here. And we met to try to figure out how we could get the project moving. The group decided Seppi had to be removed as chairman of the walkway organization. We decided to put up our own candidates for the board of directors to vote on. Five of the eight candidates elected asked me to be chairman. When I said yes, Seppi resigned. So at the annual meeting in January of 2004, I was elected chairman of the walkway organization. This photo that you're looking at now was taken at River Station where we held the thank you party for Seppi for all he had done. And he did do a lot of good things. Uh, unfortunately, you know, he, some things didn't work out and he, he was too stubborn to turn it, change his mind about doing it any other way. Most importantly, we own the bridge now and I was chairman. He still lives near the walkway, but has never been up on the bridge because he does not like the way it turned out. He is unhappy that people can bike across it too. The group discussions revolved around how to get the walk. Oops, interruption. The group discussions revolved around how to get the walkway project moving forward despite CEPI's rejection. Oh, I don't think I already read this. Oh, excuse me, man. I think, uh, yeah, the group discussions. Okay, this, this photo was taken at the uh, river station. That's the same one, let me go on. Okay, after I was elected chairman, I, I stepped in Seppi's footprints to attend the Arlington Street Fair. In the next five years, many board members, including but not limited to Dick Holler, Bill Keating, Judy Moran, and Dave Santner, did a lot to get to the opening, to get us to the opening of the walkway to the public. The most important thing I did was to meet with the town of Lloyd and to settle the lawsuit so that we could take VIPs and publics and the public on tours of the bridge. It was important so that we could get a groundswell of support and raise funds. Some of the other contributions were uh, held and attend, then attended many meetings with the walkway board uh, over a 10 year period and with the Dyson Foundation and with the engineering firm, the board hired to do the project. We took many tours of the railroad bridge with contractors, politicians, potential supporters, and anyone else we ran into. Tours started small and reached 50 or more as, they got near, as we got near construction. We networked with many community groups chamber events by carrying photos of the bridge and, and view from it to show the network and, any, and anyone I ran into. We, we made slide presentations and talked to various clubs, Rotary, Lions, History, Chambers, Garden Clubs, and colleges. 
We had meetings with dozen, dozens of politicians to explain the project, take, on, take tours of the bridge. The major one was the Quadrant Centennial Committee of New York State. I went to Albany to do a presentation of the project, which resulted in New York State giving the walkway organization $20 million for the project in return for us giving them the bridge uh, when it became that, that it would become a state park. Uh, we also took Steve's land, or I took Steve's land up on the bridge for, to us. Steve's land was a local legislator who uh, became a big fan of the bridge. Eventually, almost everybody became a fan of the bridge. Um, and one particular person, Congressman Hinchy, uh, was the first one to give us a grant uh, in October of 2004. Hinchy's grant of $500,000 from the United States transportation money for construction of the walkway. Turns out, it turned out to have a long process to put it together. So we didn't actually use this money uh, in the beginning, but we did use it for putting lights on the railings uh, after the bridge was turned into a walkway. This is another group of people we took up on the bridge and this was going on for this about a th two year period after I became chairman. Uh, Dick Holler is on the left and he did a great job of helping us with security on the bridge as we went along. Uh, these other people, all peoples who has gradually got behind the project. Okay. And this picture was taken on May 16th, 2005. Rob Dyson returned to the railroad bridge with his foundation board of directors and the foundation gave us a $45,000 grant to inspect the underwater caissons. They turned out to be in great shape. So in this picture, Dick Holler is talking about the bridge and it's Rob Dyson is in, has the black hat on and the rest of the people were uh, people involved in his foundation. So he brought the, um, his, um, foundation people out. And uh, this was sort of a turning point in his return to help us with the bridge. For over a year, myself and other board members worked on raising funds, making contacts with people who might support the project while we waited for the Hinchy money to go through channels to help us inspect the bridge. By August of 2007, we were concerned that time was running out for us to do the project in, in time for Henry Hudson's 400th anniversary. On August 8th, 2007, uh, me and two walkway board members, one, one was Dick Collar, met with Rob Dyson, and he said he would give the walkway organization a grant of $1,500,000 to inspect the bridge and design the proposed walkway and do a proposal for the new walkway to replace the railroad tracks. This was a major turning point. This picture shows how difficult it was to inspect the bridge. The, the inspection of the bridge cost $1 million. The engineers had to be trained in Colorado for repelling off the bridge because they literally looked at every inch of that, of the steel and the rest of the bridge. In November of 2007, engineers started an inspection of the bridge. Here's another picture of them doing it. They looked at every inch by repelling off the bridge. The result indicated the railroad bridge was one of the greatest structures ever built and only needed $5 million in repairs. The estimate to put a deck on the railings was another $38.5 million. Luckily, the engineers estimated that the cost to take the bridge down would be $53 million. Thus, 
it would be less money to renovate it than tearing it down. So our proposed renovation made practical sense and quelled a lot of opposition. This is a rendering that the, um, the company that we hired to do the work on the bridge uh, put forward. And as you can see, uh, this was done in uh, 2007 and it's pretty close to what the bridge looked like, but with some differences, what it looks like now, I mean. Okay, during this period of time, we had a lot, of more, lot more people involved in it. This particular picture is of uh, the 12th fellow is Peter Bergman. Uh, and he was the head of the construction company that we had agreed to use for the project. Uh, the um, lady in front of him was a, became our executive director. Dyson Foundation helped us with a lot of these people to make the contacts with and to add them to our team to get the bridge, bridge project done. Uh, the lady on the right was the uh, New York State money person that was gonna be uh, handling, getting us the $20 million. And the lady in the middle with the blonde hair uh, was from the, um, the uh, uh, no, she was not with the Dyson. She was um, with the uh, people that were putting together the celebration of Henry Hudson's 400th anniversary. Oh, it's a quadrant centennial group. And, that, and she was the contact we made with Albany uh, to, to uh, have the celebration of the 400th anniversary of Henry Hudson when it opened a few years later. Okay, this is another picture of how the team that was doing the project uh, grew grew larger and larger. I'm not going to go through each one because we, we don't have that much time. I don't know where we're going with the time, but um, you know, the Dyson Foundation uh, got us a lot of help with people who had to help us get the bridge built, and that and uh, some of them are in this picture. Mike Duffy, who is the one only one I'm going to mention, has his hands in his pockets, and he did a great job of doing the construction. He was the leader for us on the construction project, keeping the people who were doing the construction in line. And uh, he did a great job because the bridge turned out to be very good. So as we went along, uh, this is a picture of a public hearing that we staged uh, with the walkway engineering company for environmental impact statements. Uh, it was attended by 500 people. Presentations of the project by engineers and New York State representatives, public comment, comment were all in favor of the project. There were no negative statements. State representatives that had come down from Albany uh, were really uh, surprised that you had, we had so many people come out all in favor of the project, nobody against it. Um, it, this photo, Rob Dyson is on the left, Governor Spitzer, who was the one that put the $20 million in the budget for the walkway project, is in the center and I'm on the right. Um, he came to a, 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 a meeting at the um, co Chamber of Commerce. This picture is me with United States Senator Schumer who joined in support of the project after he toured the bridge in April 18 of 2008. He helped us get the one mile section of the old railroad bed leading up from the walkway to the east end of the bridge in Poughkeepsie. It was still owned by CSX as we were doing the work on the bridge. We needed it for the entrance where the bridge went into Poughkeepsie and for the parking lot. Schumer also helped obtain from CSX the railroad bed from the parking lot to Morgan Lake, which was still owned by CSS, CSX at the time. Schumer was really great in helping out and 
uh, it was nice that nice to have him on the team eventually. So by ninth, by May 28th of 2008, we were all set to get started. And this is the groundbreaking ceremony for the walkway over the Hudson project to begin. In addition to the $20 million from New York State, with the help of the Dyson Foundation, we secured about $5 million from the federal government through Congressman Hinchy and one, and uh, we also got a loan of $12, $12 million from the Ulster Savings Bank with the help of the Dyson Foundation. We, ra we raised about $3 million from the community. Total cost of the project was $38,500,000. This is a picture of the um, people taking everything off the bridge to get down to the steel. So uh, the crane was up there removing rails, removing ties, and uh, the fence. This is a picture of me after all those things were done and we got down to the steel. You can see in the background, I think there's, there was a, um, a um, oh, crane out on the bridge that was making the repairs. I guess, I think that's what's in the background. Okay, on September 11th, 2008, the first plank was put on the bridge on the west side to start the new deck. And you can see this picture of it. Uh, those planks weighed about 14 tons uh, of um, weight and they were made up in Saratoga and brought down to the bridge. The tons that were put on top of the bridge uh, weighed 20,000 tons. And uh, this is a picture of how they were put on the bridge. And here's a second, second picture of it. You know, there's a picture, they took me up in the crane so I could take pictures of the work that was being done on the bridge. And this is a picture I took from the crane that shows um, the bridge uh, with all the panels down on this section of it. And uh, we still had to put the railings in at that time. This was on September 4th of 2009. We had, we had targeted getting the bridge done uh, in October, uh, which was the 400th anniversary of Henry Hudson sailing up the river. The last panel put on the bridge uh, was in September and uh, we completed the deck and now the railings on, on the east side ownership of CSX, uh, we, um, we got the parking lot in place, in place too. So at this point, we only had about two weeks before the grand opening, but we made it. And this is the grand opening. Uh, if you weren't there, uh, a lot of people showed up first two days, a uh, total of 40,000 people uh, came out for the grand opening. And then we'll go through, what time? Well, I guess we're not too bad on time, right? Okay. So some other pictures, this is at the grand opening. The lady on the, on the right uh, was the head of New York State Parks. And uh, I still had the key to the bridge, but uh, I, I gave it to her on Monday following the opening. And uh, New York State took over the park at, at that period. Uh, in between me and her, our, the, uh, Pat Patterson was the governor. Uh, Spitzer had resigned and Patterson took over and he, he came to represent New York State at the opening. Rob Dyson is to my left uh, with the hat on and Senator Schumer was there too in this picture. Uh, we had a great opening, I hope some of you were there. Uh, Pete Seeger was out on the bridge and this was a really moment that, that brought tears to my eyes when he sang some of his songs in the middle of the bridge with a, 
thousands, thousands of people on the bridge at the time. And uh, that was a gift that was given to me, bicycle by a Dutch company. And um, that, that was my payment for doing the bridge of bicycle. <laughs> I, I never got any payment for the bridge or some other people that did, but that did the work, but uh, I, uh, I got a nice bicycle out of it. And that's me leading the first bike ride across the uh, bridge, uh, which is something I had longed for for a long time. And the uh, sunrise it turned out uh, that on the first day of spring and the first day of autumn, the sun came in line with the bridge. And I found that out because uh, for the first uh, couple of months, I opened the bridge every day because New York State didn't have enough staff to take care of opening the bridge. And uh, for 10 years, I, I wound up opening the bridge every morning for the sunrise uh, so that people could see the sunrise. And New York State people came out at eight o'clock. And uh, it was something I just loved to do because I uh, enjoyed seeing the sunrise. And Governor Cuomo came to the bridge a little while after it was open. And he uh, admitted he didn't know, he didn't uh, see the reason for it in the beginning, but he came to tell us that he was gonna give us the money, I think it was $600,000 to uh, put bathrooms on both ends of the bridge. Up to that time, we had uh, just porta potties. So uh, that made everybody a lot happy. And that's it. So uh, <laughs> I hope uh, everybody learned something about the history of the bridge and.